Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I had a customer send me an article recently and I learned something from it. So I wanted to talk about it tonight because I think it is uh, an interesting attack that has been known in the security world if you've been following like all of the black hat and all the super hackers of the world that present at these different conferences, but it, it was something that slipped my radar. So let's chat about it. Let's do it. In this article, a penetration test company was sent a black box windows device and they were tasked with seeing if they could get access to the company's internal network, the customer's network that sent them the black box windows device. So the answer to that was eventually, yes, they did get access to it, but it is important that they had physical access to this device for a while and they were able to have uninterrupted access to do all of their testing. So what they got was a Lenovo laptop that was pre-configured with the standard security stack for that company, that organization. They didn't get any information about the laptop. They didn't get any credentials, configuration details, nothing. They just got sent the Lenovo laptop. When they did their initial scans on the machine, they discovered that it had some best practices like DMA attacks were blocked because of Intel's VTD BIOS setting was enabled. All the BIOS settings were locked with a password. The BIOS boot order was locked to prevent booting from a USB or CD. Secure boot was fully enabled to prevent any non-signed op- operating systems. Con boot auth bypass did not work because of full disk encryption. So BitLocker. Land turtle and other responder attacks via USB ether net adapters returned nothing useful as well. And the full disk encryption was using BitLocker via the TPM. So pause there before you move on. You just rattled off a whole bunch of different attacks, whether that's, I mean, some of these I haven't even heard of, I'll be honest, land turtle and PCI leech and uh, con boot and all these other different methods. So, so let's just acknowledge this right here. Simply by having BIOS settings or firmware settings configured in the correct manner according to best practices, listen how many attacks that just fended off right there. Easy hacks, easy ways to break into a system were all foiled simply by configuring the PC the correct way. I just wanted to note that. That's a big deal. And that's where this pen testing company had to get really creative to continue. Go ahead, Andy. So because the machine was encrypted via BitLocker, they were able to use this design flaw in the TPM. And I'll call it a design flaw because it's not really a vulnerability. It's known in the security industry. And I didn't know about it until I read this article, but apparently you can sniff the BitLocker encryption key via the TPM bus, which is unencrypted. So imagine the TPM chip being either a physical chip that you put on the motherboard or sometimes it's integrated with the CPU, but most of the time it's a separate physical chip. So this would have to be a physical chip that's separate from the CPU and you would attach leads to where the chip is sitting on the motherboard. A lot of companies have started to kind of apply a bunch of epoxy like to those connectors to try to mitigate this attack. But in most cases, the TPM chip just sits right on the motherboard and you can attach leads and those leads can sniff the bytes that are coming out, literally the bytes of information that are coming out from the SPI bus, which is unencrypted. And so that's what this comp- this penetration company did, 
was attached the leads to it, sniff the SPI bites that are coming out, reconfigure that using a mask to discover the encryption key, the decryption key. Once you have the decryption key, they were able to decrypt the drive, the BitLocker encrypted drive. And from there, they discovered something else which allowed them to have access. So this is pretty important and a key differentiator. This company was using Palo Alto's Global Protect. And Palo Alto's Global Protect has a feature called a pre-logon tunnel. Similar to an always-on VPN configuration, it is called a device tunnel versus a user tunnel where the VPN doesn't connect until the user logs into the operating system. So this device, as soon as it's connected to the internet, reaches out and connects to an on-prem VPN. So that's kind of key in this one as well because once they decrypted the drive, they discovered the VPN tunnel and they were able to connect to on-prem. And then just purely the fact that this device was an AD joined machine and AD objects have limited but inherent rights to Active Directory. They were able to run simple SMB commands like figure out the domain controller, uh, users and groups, because you can read AD at least unless you prevent it from doing that, which you shouldn't just prevent devices from reading AD because that's just part of AD design. Everyone has read writes. And then they were able to even ping some contents of internal SMB shares because the computer just had inherent rights. So that is what they did. And it is a fairly sophisticated attack. And the customer wanted to know if the sky was falling, essentially. Oh my goodness, there's a vulnerability in BitLocker. What do you think, Adam? (laughs) So I think you did a good summary walking through this. And we will, of course, put the link in the show notes so you can read through this methodology. I thought, by the way, this was documented really, really well by the pen testing company. It's a good read. I think it's at a level that even if you're not super familiar with pen testing methodologies, you can follow the process they took. And the first thing I thought of when Andy was explaining this to me, which we should also link in the show notes, is a very famous, often used XKCD comic. And if you've never read XKCD, it's it's very nerdy. Uh, comic perfect for our audience, hopefully. And there's two characters talking in a panel where one of them is imagining a scenario where you have attackers trying to break into a machine and they said, it's no good. It's encrypted with 4,096 bit RSA blast. And then in the next panel, it's what would actually happen. And it's his laptop is encrypted, uh, drug him and hit him with this wrench until he tells us his password, right? Like, They think a lot of people think that attackers are going to go through all of this work that Andy just described about cracking open a PC and connecting stuff to the leads of the TPM and scraping off the epoxy. If there is some on uh, where the the chip is attached to the motherboard and they're going to go through all this process. And in reality, they're just going to fish your user anyway, or just, you know, drug them and tell them to give them their password or whatever. Or it's going to be on a sticky note attached to their PC because you make your users change their password every 90 days and have a whole bunch of complexity to it. Um, So, I mean, this is interesting. Like this is from a nerdery perspective. This is really interesting. Is this a vulnerability? No, I'd say it's a limitation. It's a limitation of how TPM communicates with the rest of uh, the devices on the motherboard and, and the fact that that bus is theoretically unencrypted. So what should you do about this? Well, number one, uh, a couple of things jump out at me. So the the necessity of an always on VPN where you have it connecting and authenticating using a, com- a certificate that's attached to the computer object, that necessity to have it run pre log on comes from still domain joining your PCs because we still domain join our PCs. Therefore we need line of sight to the domain controller. Therefore we want to run domain scripts and we want GPOs to apply and all this and that. 
So how do you fix that problem? You don't domain join your PCs. You move them to Azure AD join. And I'm not being trivial about this because I understand these are big steps, but these are why we articulate for things like this and advocate for things like that on this show is because you start to bring in more and more limitations to your security posture, trying to accommodate these uh, these these old ways of doing things, essentially. So if you have an Azure AD join device, there's no need and no benefit to having an always on VPN. You don't need one. You would connect to VPN opportunistically as needed. And then the other thing that jumps into my mind as I think through this is a modern zero trust posture should be that VPN is not required to do day-to-day work. VPN is only opportunistic when it's needed. And if I do have to VPN to a thing, it should be a very, very, very restricted environment through network segmentation that is access to a few of things as possible. This whole idea of letting your VPN drop a client inside your corporate network and have run of the you know, run of everything is bonkers. Like we should not do that anymore either. So I think by adopting things like a modern device identity with Azure AD join by uh, practicing zero trust strategies and network architecture, I think you can mitigate a ton of this risk. Uh, and, And so that's what really comes out to me more than saying the sky is falling. This highlights the need to get more modern in several different ways. Now, of course, if you do have an extremely sensitive device, there are options to add further um, hardening here. And Andy, I don't want to steal your thunder, so I'll let you talk about that. But if you do have for your most sensitive users, your executives, uh, people with a high level of privileged access, maybe you should look at adding some additional controls here to mitigate this risk. But for your most of your users, your day-to-day office users, as opposed to saying the sky is falling and and trying to harden full disk encryption with BitLocker and worrying about people sniffing your TPM bus and all this and that, this is a great opportunity to introduce some of those other conversations. Yeah, Microsoft actually has recommended mitigations for this specific TPM limitation, and that is to enable a pin pre-boot. And for me, I would only do this for the sensitive users. If you have an, a domain admin, a privileged access workstation or secure access workstation, a PAW or a SAW, or you're housing the keys to the kingdom, the proprietary information that is going to you know, cause your company to go out of business if it were to be compromised, that sort of stuff, you probably want to maybe think about enabling the TPM pin or the pre-boot pin. And so that BitLocker key, by default, when Windows boots, it releases the TPM key into and decrypts the drive on the fly. But if you enable the pin, you have to have a pin before the TPM will release the private key. And so that's the mitigation. When I thought about this, I wouldn't enable it for every user. Although in the pre-show, Adam, you said that you know customers who actually have this enabled for all of their users. I sat next to somebody on an airplane and I was excited because I looked over and saw they were using a Surface Pro and thinking, hey, you know, they're they're helping pay, you know, put food on my table. And then I watched this. They had a pre-boot pin and I was very sad. (laughs) I mean, it's something that you could do for regular users. Maybe that guy had, you know, super secret stuff Maybe. on his Surface Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, I, I wouldn't do this for the regular Joe. I, I don't think there's anything in my email or Adam's email that would necessitate a pre-boot pin for any of our Microsoft devices. But someone who's developing secret things for Microsoft, uh, pre-released code, you know, that may necessitate anyone who has domain admin, you know, who's on a saw for Microsoft. Yeah, I bet they have a pre-boot pin. You know, so those would be the situations that I would do that. I would not do it for the regular Joe personally. Yeah. And I think that the other thing this made me think of as well, in general, just just think of it this way with this kind of uh, thought process. If 
an attacker could gain access to the files on the drive, which is suboptimal, but if they could, but they don't have the user's credential, can you make that so that that's relatively unattractive? And if you're doing things like I talked about, having a per user VPN that requires user credentials, you are using um, zero trust network architecture principles so that even if the VPN does connect, it doesn't go anywhere really interesting. And another thing I thought of, information protection. If you're using information protection on your files so that they are entangled with the user identity and they need that to decrypt and they need the user identity to be currently valid, that's another way where even if you do have highly sensitive files in that PC, and even if an attacker breaks TPM and breaks full disk encryption and gets in, they still can't get to that stuff because there's another layer of encryption they have yet to break. So these are all good things to think about. Now, from a pre-boot pin perspective, I think you laid out the scenarios where that makes sense. And um, nobody made me judge and jury here, but I'll, I'll say... If you hear what I'm saying around Azure AD join and zero trust and information protection, but you're not there yet. Okay. Maybe if, if you really need to, if your company deals with really sensitive information regularly and your rank and file do, I'm not going to crush you for enabling a preboot pin. It's, it's a mild inconvenience at worst. However, I don't think it's necessary especially if you get to a modern state with all these things. So don't use that as a Band-Aid or as an excuse to continue down um, a, a lack of modern paths on these. Don't use it as a way to continue to invest in, you know, always on VPN, pre-boot VPN and domain joining our PCs and all that and just GPOs forever. Like <laughs> use this as, if anything, as kind of a catalyst to advance those efforts forward and say, here's another reason, boss, why we need to start getting away from GPOs and why we need to look at Azure AD and modern management and all these things. Instead of papering over them and allowing them to fester and persist even longer, use this as a catalyst for change. That's my guidance or recommendation. And just to, just to wrap things up, this attack was very sophisticated. Very. It required physical access to the device. And while they say in the article that it, they could lower the time to almost 30 minutes, the initial scan and all that, they had this for days. So if you have a physical device for that long and you don't have this pre-boot pin, yeah, it's going to be something. But I talked to several red teamers about this and they said they would never in a real world situation, go through the trouble of this. They would literally just send a phishing email. Right. So that's a really good point. And the other thing too, I, I, I didn't realize they had had it for several days. Hopefully you have good processes in place. If you do have these preboot VPNs and you do need them today, that when a user reports their laptop is missing, you have a process to like revoke the device certificate and that sort of thing. So it can't connect to VPN. It won't be recognized as valid. And that would break a lot of this risk again, too. These guys went to all this effort to crack it open and attach leads to all the thing. And they boot it up and goes, you know, not valid, can't connect to VPN. And now they just really wasted a lot of time. Exactly. So this next story, I thought tied in very well with some of the other episodes that we've done just recently. And we try not to be political, but I think this one is important in light of just democracy in general and some of the authoritarian regimes that are popping up around the world. A few weeks ago, we talked about Apple's CSAM detection. And one of the things that we identified that could be an issue is that slippery slope where if you have some sort of method to detect files or some sort, then someone, maybe China or Russia, may ask Apple to look for things that are human rights activists or something like that and be able to identify those people. Um, and we also talked about last week about ProtonMail and how companies, regardless of what they want to do, their vision, still have to follow the laws in which they are physically located, the communities and countries that they are physically located in. So I thought this story was very similar to that. 
And so a few weeks ago, Russia had their parliamentary elections. And one day before the elections, Apple and Google pulled an app from the App Store only in Russia for an opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. And if you don't know who Alexei Navalny is, he is a staunch opposition leader to Vladimir Putin in Russia. And he was a political candidate who ran against Putin. And Putin went so far as to allegedly, of course, they haven't taken any responsibility for it, but allegedly Putin had the KGB poison him. And then now Alexei has been imprisoned. So Alexei Navalny's app was designed for voters to consolidate who the best candidate would be to defeat a Putin-backed candidate. So, for example, if I had candidate A being the Putin-backed candidate and I had candidate B, C, and D, if the opposition were to split their vote between B, C, and D, then candidate A would win, the Putin-backed candidate. And so this app would inform voters which candidate of the opposition would have the best chance to beat the Putin-backed candidate. So for weeks leading up to the election, both Apple and Google had resisted. And Navalny's forces publicly and privately called upon them to uphold global democratic standards, but then literally a day before the elections, they pulled the app. And allegedly, Google removed the app in Russia under pressure after Russian officials threatened to imprison some of its local employees. And there was a notice after the apps were pulled from Apple citing that developers must follow local laws. The notice even added that we note the prosecutor's office of the Russian Federation and the prosecutor's office of the city of Moscow have determined that the app violates the legislation of the Russian Federation by enabling interference in the election. And so the decision to remove the app was made, and I think democracy in the world has suffered a little bit for it. But it just goes to show that these regimes and nation states have a lot of pull And because Apple and Google are companies that need to make money, they bow down to these regimes, in my opinion. This is a, this is a really challenging conversation, of course. Right. And on the charges, Andy, of you and I being uh, staunchly pro-democracy, we are guilty as charged. We, we definitely have live in that camp. Um, and we talked last week and, and I think we struck a tone of, yeah, what are you going to do? Those are the Swiss laws. Proton mail had to comply with the, the laws of Switzerland and they did. And, you know, suck it up buttercup. That was, there's a little bit of our attitude on that. And so it, it's challenging to come back this week and then say, well, you know, um, these are the laws in Russia, but Apple, blah, 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 should have fought them or something. It's, it's very, very challenging because, you know, absolutely, does Apple make a lot of money in Russia and especially China, where it's even more complicated for Apple? Heck yeah, they do. And I think sometimes they make this argument, and I don't know if it's good faith argument or if it's disingenuous, but they'll make the argument that we can do more by operating in the country than by leaving it entirely. And Ultimately, yeah, Apple makes a fair amount of money in Russia, but if if they left that one country, they would still be an insanely profitable company. I don't I don't think alone it's a money thing sometimes for like a company of Apple stature, although it's a lot of it. I, I think they genuinely have convinced themselves, and I don't know if this is true, that simply by operating in Russia and doing as much as they can, they're trying to help. They're trying to be a helpful force there. There are things that the the app store or the iPhone do to democratize information access or whatever, whatever Apple tells themselves to sleep well at night. And I think that's where it gets complicated because if you really get down to it, like what are their options? Well, they could defy the law. 
that could have consequences. It sounds like Google was their, their local employees were literally, literally threatened with imprisonment. So that's kind of a non-starter. They could leave the country entirely. And I think in, in some cases th there's a possibility of doing that for like a Russia, not a China, because that's literally impossible for Apple to do. Um, they could, uh, you know, stay in the country and comply with the law. And, and obviously they've chosen number three and, and we, we often say, well, they should have defied the law or they should leave the country. I don't know what the right answer is. And, and it doesn't look good. It's not a good look for these, these companies that, that speak a big game and, and to be clear are really good employers here in the United States, like really do as much for their people as they possibly can. Um, but it's not a good look for them to just kind of throw up their hands and say, all right, you know, Mr. Putin, whatever you say, that's, that's not a good look either. And, and I agree that democracy was harmed as a result of their actions here of Apple and Google. And, you know, this isn't the first time we've gone through stuff like this, is it? It isn't. I, as I was kind of researching this topic, multiple instances of where Apple and Google have kind of acquiesced to these governments. So for example, in October of 2019, Apple made a bunch of changes to its software in Hong Kong that brought the company in line with the Chinese government. And at the time they were trying to crack down on pro-democracy protesters in the financial hub. It removed the flag of Taiwan, which China doesn't recognize as an independent country from the emojis in the keyboard which I think is pretty nuts. My parents are from Taiwan and I have family there. And I mean, for the rest of the world, it's pretty much an independent nation, but because China doesn't recognize it, Apple removed the emoji for the flag. And it also removed an app from its app stores, which Hong Kong protesters were using to evade the police officers. So that happened in 2019 in 2017, Apple had removed VPNs from China uh, App Store because they were being used by citizens to master locations and circumvent websites that were censored by the Chinese government. In 2018, Apple made a deal with the Chinese data center to partner and store iCloud data inside of China, where a lot of people thought that that could be accessed and decrypted by the Chinese government, which was most likely true. Another thing that I found when I was researching this too, I mean, even Google, it happens to Google, right? There is a well-known area called Kashmir that has been under conflict between Pakistan and India for many, many years, over 70 years, and thousands of people have died fighting for this region. If you are coming from an India IP, or citizen in India, and you look at the maps, Kashmir appears to be part of India. The, the maps are drawn in the way that Kashmir appears to be part of India. But if you're coming from anywhere else in the world, the Google map shows a conflict, a dotted line. So Google, in this case, has literally redrawn the map for people who live in India to make them think that the conflict is over. So in general, I just think that there's a lot of demands that are being met by these authoritarian regimes that Apple and Google and other tech companies, you know, they're not alone. Other tech companies are kind of giving in to the demands. And these companies aren't just like starter companies anymore. They're part of the infrastructure of the world. They impact millions and millions of people all over the world. And, to me, I think they need to kind of wake up and smell the coffee and understand that they bear a lot of responsibility in how they react and how they shape the things that are going on by what they're doing. Pulling an app like this, I mean, it's it will affect the elections in Russia, right? Russia calls it interference, but it's just giving information, right? So... Obviously, under the authoritarian regime, they think it's influencing. And absolutely, I think it's influencing, but it's influencing in the 
good way of giving people information, good for democracy. And so I think anyone who's in the tech industry should really think about you know, how this stuff is, how this stuff is affecting people, real people's lives. In the interest of full transparency here, as I mentioned from time to time on this show, both Andy and I work for Microsoft. We do the show in our personal time. It is not Microsoft funded or, or related to Microsoft in any way, but just in interest of full transparency, Andy, you talked about how Apple had cut a deal with the Chinese data center partner to store iCloud data inside of China. Microsoft does something similar with uh, Office 365, where that instance in inside of greater China is operated by a company called 21 Vianet. So I did want to, to mention that. Also, while Google famously did pull out of China and does not operate there, um, Microsoft Bing is available in mainland China. And um, there was a controversy several weeks ago, I believe on the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square um, incident, where searches for that image were not available on, on the Microsoft Bing search engine. And um, the, that was later restored, and, and we had said that there was a, a bug or some other issue that had caused that problem. Um, but just in the interest of full transparency, um, our employer, too, has been caught up in, in some of these conversations from time to time. And so, it, it again, it, it extends across all of the major tech companies and having a, a responsibility to find the way to to best work within these countries, but also try to maintain their integrity on many of the the human rights they often talk about and advocate for and genuinely do a good job of here in the United States. Um, they could walk the walk as much as they talk the talk in some other countries as well. There is opportunity for that. And then just a random side note, if you ever um, are like me and sometimes you just like to read things on Wikipedia to learn where you might not you know, understand the whole background or, or information around it, Take the time to go learn the history of Taiwan and the Republic of China um, and, and that relationship with the People's Republic of China and the differences between them and why there is this ongoing dispute. It's really, really interesting. And um, I learned a ton about it because I was confused. Why is this country sometimes called Taiwan? And then why in the Olympics are they referred to as Chinese Taipei? And why do they have this weird flag with the Olympic rings in it? And you can learn a lot about that dispute and, and what's gone on with it. So um, speaking of one of these disputes, it's, it's actually a really good educational opportunity. And, and then you can speak more um, educated about it. So a little bit of a side note there. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And I think one of the things the tech companies don't do a good job on is if they are pushing back, we don't see it. And I understand sometimes these regimes don't want to see that. They don't want to see there being any pushback or any debate. And so they, they don't allow that, but it would be helpful if Apple had, you know, said like, guys, we, we fought, you know, the people's Republic of China tooth and nail on this VPN restriction. We disagree with it vociferously, but we must, you know, obey the laws of the land in that country. And, and unfortunately we have to remove them from the app store. That would go a lot farther than just saying like, Oh, well, you know, VPNs are used to subvert the will of the government or whatever. Like it, it, they almost speak like a government mouthpiece. And I think that's the part that's so frustrating is if they could at least have some, kind of frustration and humanity with these governments as well and be like, guys, we tried so hard and we couldn't make them see it our way. And we are going to continue to advocate on the behalf of Western pro-democracy, you know, pro-human rights ideals moving forward. That would go a long way. But every time they roll over to these authoritarian regimes, they do it with public facing language that almost sounds like it was written and probably was by a government mouthpiece of these regimes. And that to me is probably the most frustrating part. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent agree there. Well, these were two articles that I wanted to highlight. I thought they were extremely interesting and that's our show for this week. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have topics that you want to talk about or have questions that you want us to answer. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. 
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAWZERO and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.